Now then, uh, today's guest is best known for playing Albert Square's Ricky Butcher, one half of one of the most iconic couples in EastEnders history. Back in 1997, 22 million of us were glued to our screens as Ricky and Bianca tied the knot. Well, Sid Owen's life off screen has been just as colourful as his character, and he is now here to tell us all about it with his new memoir. Hi, Sid. Hi, girls. How you doing? Hi, Sid. Lovely to see you. Now, listen, this book, most people struggle to find things to put in their autobiography, particularly about their childhood. But my goodness, I mean, you must have been struggling of to what to leave out. You've had such a fascinating and I would say challenging upbringing. Was going over it all now quite cathartic for you? I mean, are you sort of having to process things now that you maybe never dealt with when you were a kid? Oh, 100%. I mean, it sort of just like when I first started to write it, like it's just that build up of like, you know, eventually sitting down to write it. I, uh, I just sort of went, you know, I was getting just like, emotional just out of nowhere and uh you know sort of getting angry and going through all lots of emotions because i knew that i was you know just going to delve back into my uh past and uh you know start regurgitating stuff so yeah it was very difficult but you know i'm glad that i've done it because uh you know it's helped me again a lot you know you sort of realize later on in life that you know that's why you would sort of behaving like an idiot or, you know, you, you go through all these sort of emotions and uh, so I'm sort of glad I've got it off my chest a bit. I mean, just, just you know, a couple of the points. So your, your dad went to prison when you were six years old and then your mum uh, died of cancer when you were seven years old. I mean, that is so much to deal with uh, as a young child. And I'm, what sort of happened to you? Because obviously in this day and age, you may well have ended up in, in care. So, so where did you yeah. go? Well, basically, my mum's sister uh, sort of stepped in. I mean, uh, you know, uh, from the book, there's there's four brothers, and uh, the, the two youngest stayed with my mum's sister. And uh, you know, I was sort of moved about here, here there, and everywhere, really, because uh, we were a little bit wild. And now I understand why I was a bit wild. You know, uh, with no sort of uh, proper direction. You know, uh, you know, years ago I was a sort of a naughty kid. But, uh, you know, I suppose now if, I, you know, people, kids had that sort of help, then, uh, you know, then people would understand and, you, you, you know, you wouldn't be pushed aside as opposed to uh, you'd be diagnosed with, you know, certain things as opposed to be just being, being called a problem child or a, or a naughty boy. So, uh, you know. Sid, I was just going to say, um, you know, the, the first chapter of your book is even riveting because... You're the uh, product of your, your mum. It was her third relationship as such. And the boys, of course, other your brothers had been born before you. But there was a lot of crime within your family that you've been very, very open about and very honest. What, what sort of crime was, was taking place and how were you conditioned to that sort of growing up? Well, what it was, I mean, uh, sad to say, it was pretty much the norm as a, as a kid, like petty, uh, petty theft. It was, you know, day to day sort of survival. Like, you know, it was, uh, you know, you'd even nicking from nicking sweets or clothes. So it was, uh, you know, it wasn't anything sort of like on my behalf too, sort of that ruthless. But uh, to us, it was just uh, the norm. You know, um, it was like what most kids did in growing up in a council estate. Sid, something that definitely is not the norm for a lot of people, I'm really interested to know about your relationship with Al Pacino and how you nearly became adopted by him. <laughs> how, what, uh, come on, what, how did this I know. Yeah, very, very strange. Now, very weirdly, uh, well, Linda Robson, who actually went to Anna Schur, so where I grew up, uh, there was a drama group called Anna Schur, which was uh, luckily in Islington. So, you know, I joined that at a very young age and, you know, got the flavour which, you know, helped me basically sort of channel my energies, really, uh, and my anger into acting, you know, which uh, it sort of, you know, it sort of took my mind off of things and, you know, made me go elsewhere and, you know, play characters. And, that you know, that's why I sort of uh, thank, thank God for Anna Schur that it sort of saved my life. And uh, the funny thing is, the guy that I write with, he's, uh, 
his daughter, she's a lot older now, and she's, she's actually a, an amazing actress. And uh, she had a stutter and she had a bit of a problem as a kid. And where she took up acting, she actually, uh, that actually left her. So for me, it did, it helped me with a lot of things. And I, I really, I can't be thankful enough. And uh, luckily I, I did, I got to work with Al Pacino. Wow. And, uh, you know, it was like the best, best job in the world. I mean, I, I weren't really aware of who Al Pacino was back then. I thought he was uh, Sylvester Stallone. He looked like him. <laughs> Uh, I'd never do what Al Pacino was because uh, you know he was in his movies were like Scarface and you know The Godfather, so I'd never got to, to watch those. So, uh, but no, it was an amazing experience, and uh, you know it was just every day on set with Al Pacino was like a masterclass. So I, I couldn't have uh, you know learnt in a better place. But did he sort of spot that you were a bit of a lost soul? He sort of took you under his wing, didn't he? I think so. I mean, mainly because you know. He had to get some work done, so <laughs> he sort of uh, took, put me under his wing and, you know, I had to go and see him every day religiously, like to run lines, and if I didn't, you know, he was always sort of keeping a check and, you know, he'd buy me, like, the, the Atari console just so, you know, just to keep me out of trouble. Wow. So, uh, no, I was, I'm was i very grateful for that. And, I mean, that know. that's some hardcore training. That's some hardcore training. Did that, working with Al Pacino, did that set you up for then stepping onto the iconic set that is EastEnders? I mean, back then, 22 million, did you feel that pressure or do you think you had it in check because of Al? <laughs> well, I mean, I probably got the job because I, you know, worked with Al Pacino. But, you know, something like EastEnders, it's like, you know, I still, I never, I remember now going, you know, thinking back, it was like, it took me a good year or so to settle in. It's like, you're always sort of learning again on the job. It's, uh, you know, and it was such an iconic show when I joined it. And, uh, you know, I walked on set and, you know, I was sort of pinching myself and just wanting to, uh, you know, get an autograph of Sharon or, or Pat. And, uh, <laughs> but, That's um, your first you know, episode. <coughs> Yeah, this is my first episode yeah. in the pub, yeah. yeah. And I was really so nervous, you know. I mean, I remember back in the day when I first started acting, I didn't, like, in, in EastEnders, I, I, I found it hard to sort of smile and talk. And, uh, <laughs> you know, all these little things that you look back on. How do you say shame. Ricky? I want to ask Sid, how do you say Ricky? How is How are we meant to say it? Because you've heard it enough times. Okay. <laughs> Hi. 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 Well, Hi. Sid, it's been absolutely <laughs> fabulous talking to you. Um, your book, Rags to Ricky, is, is out, and, it, and we thoroughly recommend it as a great read. And we hear rumours that you might be coming back to EastEnders, so we're going to keep um, a lookout for that as well. So thanks so much for, for joining us today, and we'll see you soon. Uh, thanks very much, girls. Bye. Bye-bye.